So thanks for joining us for our, our June series. And this series is about modular curves and Galois representations, also with the focus on rational points and isogenies. And uh, this is our first time where we're gonna have two talks um, in our summer series. And we're very happy to have our, our first talk by Aiken Osman. And this is on the topic of quadratic points on modular curves and Fermat type equations. And Aiken, is it all right if we video this talk? Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Well, please get started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation. Um, and uh, the title is, on, is already, uh, I think, seen for all of you, by all of you. Um, so I will uh, start by um, a motivation, um, although maybe it's unnecessary for this series because um, the series is about uh, points, uh, rational points on uh, modular curves, isogenies, uh, torsion points. So um, we may not need a motivation, <laughs> maybe. Uh, however, I usually start this talk in this manner, and I think it's um, it gives a nice connection uh, with um, the in a, a slightly uh, different uh, subject, uh, which is the um, Lyapunov equations and studying their solutions. So let me start in that manner. Um, and I think uh, all of us uh, may agree that uh, Fermat's equation is uh, maybe the most important Diophantine equation that um, people may have heard of. And um, the method that is being used in, in the solution of Fermat equation, uh, so-called the modular method, uh, can also be uh, applied a uh, similar type of Diophantine um, equations. For example, um, you may want to add uh, coefficients uh, A, B, C uh, next to the uh, terms X, Y, and Z, Z. And this may sometimes be called as a generalized Fermat equation. Uh, or you may uh, want to defer the exponents instead of all being the same, you may want um, to vary them. And sometimes this may be referred as a twisted Fermat equation. Um, so any uh, equation of this type, similar to this, um, can be attacked um, uh, using the similar methods used in the proof of Fermat, Fermat's theorem. But this is a hard uh, theorem. Uh, it's proof took um, hundreds of years uh, for us um, to, I mean, for, for, for the, uh, the community to uh, complete and which finally um, was done by Wiles and Taylor Wiles. Uh, and lots of tools uh, had to be um, developed for that. Uh, so it's not easy, uh, but how do we approach um, such a problem? Well, if you have something which is not easy, uh, you may want to relate it to something which is even harder. <laughs> and in this case, it's the absolute color group. Uh, which is the most mysterious object of number theory, maybe. Maybe it's fair to say that, which all of us uh, in some way or another way um, is related to this object. And we try to understand this. <laughs> and of course, this is, you know, maybe an impossible task to accomplish, uh, but we still try. <laughs> and uh, how do we um, understand uh, the structure of a group in general? We try to look at its representations. That's one way of studying um, the, uh, groups. And um, in this case, uh, the representations that uh, we will uh, consider uh, are coming from uh, another familiar object, uh, the elliptic curves. Um, so EP is the p-torsion uh, subgroup of the uh, complex points of an elliptic curve. And the absolute color group of the rationals act on this subgroup. And therefore, we obtain uh, the mod p representation. Um, and that uh, is uh, one of the things that is, um, uh, you know, a, a key uh, ingredient, let's say, of the proof of uh, Fermat's last theorem. Uh, obviously, uh, it's, uh, you know, not, uh, the purpose is not uh, to give you an overview of this uh, result. Most of you already know it uh, very well. Uh, but if somebody wants to summarize the strategy of the proof in, in two sentences, maybe uh, it's a very over, over uh, simplification can be the following. Um, we are assuming that there is a solution to this equation. And then uh, we are attaching an elliptic curve to this proposed solution. And then somehow we are obtaining conflicting properties of the elliptic curve, and therefore we're getting a contradiction. That's the 
uh, very quick uh, oversimplified uh, summary of the strategy of the proof. But of course, what goes in the proof is much, much deeper. And um, I like uh, to weave this proof as a, a stool with uh, three uh, legs. Uh, and the two legs are uh, the modularity theorem, and the uh, famous theorem of Wiles and Taylor Wiles, and then the level low lowering result of Ribe. And um, the oldest one, uh, as, as the, as one as in, in the main ingredients of the proof, which is maybe the um, main subject of this talk, is Mazur's uh, celebrated result um, about the irreducibility of Galois representations. So this is the uh, map that uh, we had seen in the previous slide. Um, and Mazur um, gave us um, a complete answer uh, about uh, the uh, parameterization of these uh, representations uh, when we are considering elliptic curves or over rationals. So what does that result or how do we uh, parameterize um, all of these, uh, all of such maps? Um, uh, irreducible here, meaning that the representation is not upper triangular, and we parameterize all these uh, representations using um, the classical modular curve, sometimes it's called that way, um, X0P. Um, so X0P, uh, non-cuspidal points on this modular curve, uh, parameterizes um, the mod P Galois representations, which are uh, upper triangular. And therefore, if uh, there are no such uh, points on the uh, on, no, on the classical modular curves, then there are no such representations. Uh, so the question is, uh, what are the rational points uh, on the classical modular curve? And the answer uh, is mostly given by Mazur. Uh, whenever n is prime um, and bigger than 163, uh, the set, uh, the set of rational points on the classical modular curve um, consists of only cusps. And the cusps are, I should say, they are um, natural points. They are easy to find points. We know what they are uh, from the very beginning. So for the people who have not uh, maybe uh, dealt with this uh, object before, um, cusps are uh, like our best friend. We know, we know what they are. You don't need to worry about them. Okay, um, later, later this, has, this result has been generalized to composite levels and the situation for small levels have also been understood uh, by Kenko and Momose. So we have a great result. We have a complete answer uh, for the rational points on the classical modular curve X0 n. So an obvious um, question then, maybe uh, what about the rational points uh, defined over higher degree number fields? This is natural because it just comes right after uh, Mazur's big result. It's also something that is necessary to know if you want to um, attack Fermat-type equations um, uh, using modular method. If you want to understand their solutions over higher degree number fields, um, you need uh, these type of results defined over higher degree number fields. So we need to know uh, as much as we can about uh, X0 and K. K here is a number field. Um, we don't know much, <laughs> that's the point. And before I say uh, what is known, uh, maybe we should compare the situation with X1 and K because uh, although they are closely related, uh, the situation in these two curves are drastically different. Um, we know a lot of things about X1 and K, but the situation is much less happy for X0 and K. So what was uh, the um, moduli structure of X1 and K? Um, the points are corresponding to tuples, um, EP, um, where E is an elliptic curve um, defined over uh, a number field K, and P is an n-torsion K-rational point on E. Uh, versus X0n, uh, well, I told the uh, moduli interpretation in terms of 
um, Galois representations. But uh, another point of view, uh, an equivalent point of view, uh, is um, seeing a k rational point of x0 n as a tuple again, E and C this time, where C is um, a cyclic um, group of order n. Um, and as a group, it is k rational, right? Or the corresponding isogeny phi here uh, is a k rational isogeny. Um, so this difference uh, makes it slightly make, makes it much more harder um, for x zero n um, uh, compared to x one n, uh, at least in this um, in this um, subject. So what do we know? What do we know about X1 and K? Uh, by Mazur's work, we know it only consists of cusps uh, if its genus is bigger than one. And then we have uh, Merrell's result, uh, which gives a uniform bound uh, for X1 and K. Here, K is any number field of degree less than or equal to D. So just depending on the degree of the number field, there is a bound. Um, and there are also more precise results, much more precise results by uh, several people. Um, I might have forgotten some of the names, um, but Kamiani, Parent, Derek, Stein, and Stoll are, um, uh, have, have proved lots of uh, precise results about k rational points on x1. Um, but unfortunately, uh, not much is known for x0 and k, uh, except um, the following um, results. Before I state the results, I need to um, make a definition. Um, I will refer a point uh, on the modular curve x0 n as a quadratic point um, if the field of definition um, has degree two. Um, okay, um, so uh, the first result uh, that I will uh, state is due to Bars and Harry Silverman, uh, which says that if the genus uh, is at least two, um, then uh, there are a finitely many quadratic points uh, on X0n except um, for 28 values of n. Um, the next result is by uh, Brun and Neisman. Um, they parameterized all quadratic points on X0n under the conditions that the Jacobian um, is torsion, so has zero moduli rank, and the curve is hyperelliptic. And the corresponding n are the ones that are listed there. Okay. So here, um, I want to emphasize that this is a result that parameterizes all quadratic points. So you are varying k among all number fields of degree two and finding um, all the uh, points defined on these k's for the values of n that are listed here. Um, okay. And the next theorem is uh, a joint work with Samir Siksek. Um, we uh, focused on um, the uh, version, the, the remaining sort of uh, stuff, where the curve is non hyperelliptic and still the uh, Jacobian has, is torsion, so zero moduli rank. Um, but obviously, uh, we have to restrict the genus. So the genus is for us between three and five. As uh, I mean, as you may all know, like when the genus gets higher, it gets much more complicated to work with these curves. So we went up to genus five, um, and these are the corresponding n values, and that satisfies these three conditions. Uh, and for those, uh, we found and parameterized all quadratic points, um, like uh, Brown and Najman did. So we varied k uh, among all degree two number fields and found uh, all the points defined on any of these k's for any of these n's that are listed. Okay, so now we have a full list of all quadratic points uh, with genus starting at two up to five uh, under the constraint that the Jacobian is torsion. Um, and then this result uh, has been um, improved 
uh, by uh, Box, um, and he dealt with uh, sort of the remaining cases that was left. Uh, again, the genus is between two and five. The curve is non hyperelliptic but he lets the uh, he want he assumes that the Jacobian uh, has positive Mordelay rank. So the remaining cases have been covered uh, thanks to this theorem. Um, and then we have really a full list of all the quadratic points uh, for this genera between two and five. Okay, um, this may sound like, okay, good, like, but why is this helpful? Uh, like, how can we connect this um, right away, maybe, to the uh, starting point, uh, the Diophantine equations? Um, maybe uh, the connection can be summarized um, as follows, like um, if you want to run the modular approach to solve the Diophantin equation, at some point you require the irreducibility of the mod P representation of a Frey elliptic curve E defined over K. This is the elliptic curve that is attached to your proposed solution of the equation that you are working on. And then um, this Frey elliptic curve uh, often has extra level structure in the form of a k-rational two isogeny or a three isogeny. And if you combine these two informations now, um, you get the following. If the mod p representation is reducible, then the Frey curve attached to your proposed solution gives rise to a point, a k-rational point on x0, 2p or x0, 3p. So understanding the k-rational point for small levels uh, is helpful in this in this sense. Okay, so to be able to uh, complete um, the proof of your uh, Diophantin uh, equation uh, work. Uh, for example, um, this has been used uh, by Freitas and Sixek to find the quadratic solutions of the classical Fermat equation. Uh, the specifically this curve X034 was used. Um, and just to you know, give you a glimpse of uh, what we mean by the parameterization uh, of quadratic points, this is, for example, um, sum a summary of the situation for X034. Um, on the top, you see the uh, structure for the Jacobian of this curve. And then these are the quadratic points, all of them uh, on this, uh, that are lying on this curve uh, using this model that we have here. So uh, we only listed the curves up, uh, the points up to conjugation. If you look at the field of definition here, you can see it here. All the quadratic points are defined either uh, over Q adjoin uh, square root of minus one, uh, or Q adjoin square root of minus two, or Q adjoin square root of minus 15. Um, so those are the only number fields that uh, we see uh, for uh, X034. Okay, so um, that is the result and why uh, somebody might care about it um, if, if it's not the solely the purpose of studying the rational points. Um, you might be coming from a different angle, uh, but it might still be useful. Um, but then how do we prove such a result? Um, how can we um, find uh, all quadratic points on an arbitrary curve? Um, there is a theoretical approach. Uh, let me first start with that. Um, our curves are non hyperelliptic So if you have, this is a general thing that works for any non hyperelliptic curve um, whose genus is at least uh, three. And let's say the Jacobian is uh, finite. Um, and we also assume that there is a rational point on the curve uh, to start with. This rational point um, is denoted by P sub zero here. Um, this assumption is uh, not a huge assumption for us, uh, for our modular curves. If we recall, we have cusps on our modular curves and there are, uh, there are always rational cusps. So P0 is okay for us. Um, the next thing uh, in this theoretical approach is enumerating all the rational points on the Jacobian. This is a quite non-trivial thing to do, but if it can be done, let's say it can be done for a second, then uh, we can uh, move on as follows. We form the symmetric product, 
of our curve uh, x, uh, namely uh, x2 here. And then um, we can embed the rational points on the symmetric product into the rational points on the Jacobian. How? Uh, first of all, a rational point um, on the symmetric product is um, a set, uh, sort of, an unordered tuple, uh, better to say, um, which consists of P1, P2, where either these uh, two points, P1, P2, are honest rational points on your curve, or they are defined um, over a quadratic number field K, and they are Galois conjugates of each other. Um, so that's that's a, a rational point on the symmetric product. Uh, given this point P, uh, we can uh, construct the divisor uh, dP uh, as the sum of P1 and P2. Okay, and then uh, we can form this emb embedding iota, uh, which takes P and sends it to dP uh, to the class of dP minus two times P0. Here, P0 is again the rational uh, point that we have, okay? All right, so now, if now if your Jacobian is torsion and uh, if you can enumerate uh, everything in it, then you can pull back those finitely many points, theoretically at least, and then you can um, possibly determine um, this set, the rational points on the symmetric product, which then gives you all the quadratic points on your curve. So that's the idea. Uh, but uh, practically, in, in practice, uh, this is not usually working. Um, why? Because um, I mean, this requires this this um, method requires uh, computations uh, involving uh, complicated Riemann-Roch spaces. Uh, for example, for each divisor class d prime uh, on your uh, Jacobian, you can enumerate the effective degree two divisors that are linearly equivalent to d prime plus two times p zero, and then compute the Riemann-Roch space of this. Um, divisor. And uh, the, this Riemann-Roch space uh, will either have dimension zero or one. If it's dimension zero, then there are no such effective degree to divisor D equivalent to, to, to D prime plus two B zero. If the dimension is one, then uh, there is an F and then uh, using this F, uh, the, you can form uh, the unique effective degree to divisor equivalent to um, d prime plus 2b0. Um, so this is, you know, in theory, it, it makes sense again, but in practice, uh, these computations are not feasible. Uh, they never end. <laughs> um, it's very hard to enumerate um, the torsion uh, points on the Jacobian. Even if it is done, it can be too big and the computations um, can be complicated. So what did we do instead? Um, uh, together with uh, Samir, uh, we started with um, the well-known subgroup uh, of J0 and Q. So J0 and Q is maybe too ambitious to start with, uh, but there is a subgroup of it which is uh, not so bad um, to work with. Um, this is the rational cuspidal subgroup. I'm going to define what it is um, very soon, but uh, it consists of uh, cusps, or it, it, it is determined by cusps. So, uh, so computing the cuspidal rational, rational cuspidal subgroup is immediate. That's what I'm trying to say. And then we bounded its index uh, in the bigger group that we are interested in. Let's say we, this index is i. So I times the Jacobian rational points on the Jacobian is inside um, the cuspidal group C. Here C uh, is my shorthand notation for C0N. I, I forgot to say that. Okay, um, and then the effective degree to devices that we are looking for, um, if you remember from the previous slide, um, they uh, satisfy um, this relation. D times two P zero is equal to I times the class of D prime. Um, and afterwards, um, we 
still this may be a lot of divisors to deal with, uh, we apply a version of the Mordovay sieve. Mordovay sieve is a, a classical tool um, to study uh, racial points on curves. So we apply a version of it and eliminate uh, most possibilities uh, for this D prime. And only then, only then afterwards, we only have a handful of D prime, a very few to work with. Only then we use remark. Um, so that's the summary of um, our approach. And I would like to now um, give some details um, on some of the steps um, to, you know, um, explain, to be able to explain a little bit better how we um, dealt with the computations. Okay, so let's start with the definition of the um, rational cuspidal group, um, C0n. Um, so it is generated by classes of differences of cusps and C0n is called the cuspidal subgroup. Then we can look at its rational part, meaning the group of points stable under the action of the absolute Galois group of Q. And this is called the rational cuspidal subgroup. Uh, what do we know about this subgroup? Uh, it is obviously a subgroup of um, J0 and Q. And uh, there's uh, the theorem of Meinen and Dirnfeld, which says that this uh, cuspidal subgroup is a uh, torsion. And therefore, the rational cuspidal subgroup is inside uh, the rational torsion uh, part of the Jacobi. Um, then we have uh, a conjecture of Oak, uh, which is proved by Mazur, uh, when uh, the level N is prime, these two groups, the torsion part of the rational, uh, the torsion part of the rational subgroup, rational group of J0N and um, rational cuspidal subgroup, they coincide when N is prime. That's what I mean. Um, what about N is composite? That's unknown. That's uh, sometimes referred in the literature as the generalized Oak conjecture, um, which says that C0 and Q is equal to J0 and Q torsion for all that. Um, so along the way, uh, when we are trying to parameterize the quadratic points for these modular curves, we had to compute um, the Jacobian, torsion part of the Jacobian. And uh, along the way, we were able to, uh, you know, uh, like, verify a uh, generalized of conjecture uh, for the, these values of n. So these values of n um, are not the complete list of n that I gave in the beginning. Uh, there are some n's missing here, um, meaning that we were able to parameterize quadratic points um, for some modular curves, but we were not able to um, decide uh, where uh, if, if J0 and Q torsion is precisely the rational cuspidal subgroup for some n. Okay, uh, I will say a few words about that um, in the later slides. But this is, you know, uh, uh, something we obtained along the way as well. Okay, um, so this is my this will be my notation from now on. Uh, X will be X zero n, and J is the Jacobian. C is the rational cuspidal subgroup. Uh, so we will work with uh, places rather than uh, points because it's more convenient computationally um, to work with places. Um, and a place on a curve is simply a set of distinct points um, that is stable under the action. Uh, of, Gala, of the absolute Gala group. And, and that uh, finite set of distinct points uh, forms a single orbit uh, under this Gala action. Uh, and the size of this distinct list of points uh, will be called the degree uh, of the place. And it happens to be that um, this degree is also uh, the degree of the field of definition um, of, uh, of, of that point, okay? Um, all right, so we have a degree one cusp place, meaning that we have a rational cusp always. Um, we will denote this by P0, curly P0. This can be either the cusp at infinity or the cusp at zero. And then there will be other cusps. Uh, I will list them as P1 through PR, other cusp places. 
the rational cuspidal group is then generated by um, uh, these divisor classes, the difference between pi and degree pi times p0. Um, okay, and then we will determine the structure of this um, of this C. Um, I should say that, like, uh, whenever we, uh, whenever it's, it was possible, of course, we did our computations um, uh, over a finite field. So these uh, computations, uh, I, I state here is as, as over Q. Obviously, we found the result at the end of the day over Q. But uh, when we were uh, coding this, when we were writing the results, uh, writing the co uh, computational part. Um, uh, things like behind the scenes, things took place um, over the finite fields uh, most of the time. And how? <laughs> Let's see. So we, we pick a good prime, a prime that's not dividing um, 2n. And then uh, using magma, we compute this uh, Picard group, which is isomorphic to um, uh, JFP. Um, and then the images of these classes uh, under the composition um, generate a subgroup of um, JFP that is isomorphic to uh, the rational cuspidal subgroup C. So CQ embeds in JQ torsion. This is the Menander in fact theorem. Uh, in our case, JQ torsion and JQ are the same, but in any way it embeds in there. And then this embeds in JFP where P is a good prime. Okay. Um, all right, so now how do we, um, you know, uh, how do we approach it? How do we find this? Uh, we, we view it as a group theory problem, sort of. So uh, what are we trying to do? We have this diagram. Maybe I should start with that. C is embedding into JQ, and I have here JFP. This is reduction, reduction mode PMAP. And I'm looking for uh, all um, A's. What's A? A is um, a group. Uh, inside JFP, a subgroup of JFP, which contains image of the rational cuspidal group under the reduction map mode P. And iota is the rest restriction of this reduction map to C. So this iota is just the restriction of the reduction map. Um, and this um, purely AP bar uh, prime is um, the set of all such possible um, A's. Okay. And for some iota in this um, uh, set, we have an isomorphism mu. And our aim is to find that mu, to find that A, so that we will know the structure of uh, the Jacobian. OK, okay. so uh, before, we do, uh, uh, before, before we start um, the big part of the computation, we did something to simplify it. Um, we know uh, it's, we, we have information about the structure of JQ. Um, this is um, a result of um, Gross and Harris uh, that gives us uh, the structure of JQ in terms of the genus of the curve and the real components of uh, the Jacobian. And using this, we can eliminate some of the possibilities uh, from our curly AP bar prime. Uh, we just... Uh, get rid of the ones that are inco incompatible with this information here. So we obtain a subset. This is the set uh, which I will call AP. Okay. And now it's time to uh, combine all this information uh, with um, uh, you know, more uh, primes. <laughs> so we will have P1 through PS distinct primes, again, good primes of good reduction and primes different than P itself. And we will now consider the following set. Um, this is a refiner set. This is a, a refinement of um, this original set AP. It consists of iota going, coming from C going to A, such that for all P prime uh, among these uh, finitely many primes, um, there is an iota prime uh, here, um, which makes this diagram uh, commutative, where this um, map between A and A prime is an isomorphism. So at this point, in fact, one can forget about um, modular curves or uh, rational points. This turns into a group theory problem. 
what's the problem? This is the problem. We have finite abelian groups, CAA prime, and we have injective homomorphisms, iota and iota prime. Is there an isomorphism between A and A prime that makes this uh, diagram commutative? And it is possible to give an effective answer to this question. I'm not gonna uh, give you the details of how, but it's possible. Um, and after that, what, after that, uh, what can we do? Um, remember, we are trying to understand this set, this curly AP, uh, P1 through PS. This set must, this set is not empty, first of all. This set must contain at least the so-called, uh, you know, most basic, most trivial element in it, the iota zero, I'm gonna denote it by that, where a zero is just the reduction um, of C mod P, okay, the obvious one. So there is at least one element there, and our aim is to find suitable primes such that this set has size one. And therefore, the uh, element that you that is there is only iota zero, and hence um, JQ is uh, the cuspidal uh, rational cuspidal subgroup. So that's the aim. We want to uh, prove that the size of this set is one. Sometimes, most of the time, we were able to. Sometimes we were not. But even, uh, I mean, uh, nevertheless, the size is not so big. So we have uh, we know the index. We have that i that I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, so even if we don't know the size is one, we still know um, what's the co-kernel uh, of this iota. Uh, and we have this positive integer i such that i times the Jacobian is inside uh, C. All right. Okay. Um, that's the summary so far where we are. Um, and then computationally, how uh, did it go? Uh, for each value of n that we had um, in our list, uh, it was not so bad. That the, this slide is just to explain you that, that it was not so bad after all this. Uh, we picked p to be the smallest prime not dividing 2n. And then p1 through ps were all primes less than uh, or equal to 17 and not dividing 2pn. So uh, the, like, uh, the set was really small. The P1 through PS that we had to consider was not that bad. OK, so now we know all the possible Gs, uh, where G is the quotient of um, J, the Jacobian uh, over the uh, rational cuspidal subgroup. And we let I be the least common multiple of these exponents. And therefore, we have the um, required inclusion. And then how do we uh, continue? So we have, we, thanks to Mazur, XQ is known. We know uh, what are the points on, on that. So using those uh, rational points, we can form a set of effective degree two divisors, K0. Um, this set is good, but then we can also find uh, easily, uh, or I mean quickly, uh, a few more random quadratic points on our curves by doing some hyperplane intersections. Uh, and we enlarge this K0 uh, by adjoining P and P sigma, where P is uh, one of those quadratic points and P sigma is its Galois conjugate. So we obtain a known set of degree two divisors on X. Okay. And then we obtain, we, we apply um, a, a, a kind of a more divisive for suitable choices of primes of good reduction. We find a subset of the Jacobian that contains all the possibilities. Um, I times D minus two P zero here, D, D is uh, an element taken from um, the rational points of the symmetric product minus this uh, known set of degree two divisors K, okay? And in, in almost all cases, we were able to find that S is empty. So therefore we uh, can make sure that um, this uh, rational points on the symmetric product is really, um, this set K, okay? So remember the aim, the aim was uh, describing this rational points on the symmetric product. So uh, the aim is achieved um, if we have this um, equality, this uh, curly K is already known. Um, I say in almost all cases, because uh, in, in two cases, we had to do uh, slightly different uh, things, um, but the idea was similar. 
Okay, so I want to now restate the theorem uh, in, in more explicit uh, terms. Uh, for these values of n, the quadratic point, points, um, uh, there are no quadratic points except the cusps. Um, if uh, v is um, different than these values. So only for these v's there are quadratic points. And therefore, that, uh, you know, I feel like I should end with an open question. So this may not be uh, a very well stated open question, um, but um, that's how I state it. So um, the question is says that uh, if there's a, it asks if there's a bound P um, such that for all D uh, whose absolute value is greater than this bound, uh, X zero N doesn't have any non-rational quadratic points um, for any N. Um, let's just say that uh, the genus is bigger than two, okay? Hyperlytic. Um, we don't want the genus to be too yeah. Okay, so um, it, I mean, I, we wanted to ask this question because I mean, when you look at this list, they are not that big. Um, they are sparse. Of course, you might ask more meaningful questions, maybe not just a bond, but something else. Um, but yeah, there are lots of unknown things there. That's, um, that's why uh, I think it's uh, interesting um, to work in this area. <laughs> okay, I think that's all I want to say for your time. Thank you. Well, Aiken, thank you so much. Uh, so now this is a great time for questions. Does anyone want to start off the questions? Um, Yes, hi, Ekin. Uh, I had one quick question. So um, I noticed in your X034 example, uh, all of the quadratic points were defined over imaginary quadratic fields. Yes. So my, my, question, my question is, uh, is there some a priori reason why you would expect that? Like, you would not expect uh, any points over real quadratic fields. I, I have no a priori reason. And in fact, uh, there are uh, ends uh, who has uh, quadratic points over real quadratic fields as well. It's not happening over X034, but there are other ends in our list that, that it's happening. So I don't think, um, I, don't, I don't have any a good explanation for X034, but I don't, I, maybe there is none, I don't know. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, this is Rachel, I had a, a question. Do you think um, when you were looking at those sets of primes and you know controlling this subgroup A prime using several primes. Uh, do you think it'd be possible that you could do this with just two primes or just um, that that for each one that there would be a good choice of two primes for which it would work? Yeah, 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 that's a good question. Yes, uh, in fact, like in many of our examples, we only needed two or three primes. Mm -hmm. So for each N, uh, the, the set was different, the, the necessary primes were different, but um, the uh, size, uh, I don't think we ever used something with four primes in it. So it, it was really uh, quick in that sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. So are there some more results in the context of uh, this higher, I mean, uh, number fields of higher degree? Uh, apart from quadratic extensions, so I mean, apart from uh, quadratic extensions, uh, are there for higher degree extensions like cubic or biquadratic or anything? Some results are known. Oh yeah, so uh, I, the, everything that I explained here works for quadratic uh, because uh, uh, everything uh, is related to the symmetric uh, product x two. Uh, so if you want to apply same method, uh, then. Uh, you have to start with a different object. Because uh, at, at the end of the day, we are trying to understand X2Q, uh, the rational points on the two-fold symmetric product. And that only uh, gives okay. you the points, yeah. Okay, I see. No, but generally the question makes sense even for the cubic fields or uh, biquadratic fields, like when you want to study the rational points. In that context, I'm asking. You mean, yeah, you, 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 yeah, you can, you can. Uh, I haven't, but yeah, somebody may, may can, uh, may work on that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Great, let's see any more questions. I was curious, <clears throat> I, well, I had two questions really. Uh, first, maybe to ask what would, other than just being more work, what's in, what would be involved in extending this to genus greater than five? I mean, are there any particular obstacles or what makes it harder? Uh, like, so um, we had to, like, of course, we, we had to compute um, the equations and the J maps uh, from scratch. Like they, even though they were uh, computed uh, already in Galbraith's thesis, for example, the models at least, we had to redo them because we uh, need to explicit J maps um, to be able to give the give the parameterization. Um, that's something um, that you know may maybe may may take time or uh, computation maybe not feasible. Um, and then like the yeah the um, index. Uh, we, we were not getting the equalities and we were the, the possibilities for the Jacobian were, were getting much, much uh, larger. So uh, for Jacobian, we have in, in our uh, paper, we have either C or, uh, you know, uh, this or that and not, nothing else. Like in almost all the cases we have, uh, we, we find it as C. And in some other cases, we have one or two more possibilities. But when the genus gets higher, um, the possibilities were also uh, you know, the, the competitions were not ending. So we were finding two, three possibilities and we were not sure if this was everything. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> that's helpful. And, and maybe some motivation for people to work on computing more explicit models and, and JMAPs. Um, I'm thinking of one of my co-authors in the audience right now. Um, <laughs> My other question was, I was struck by your comment, maybe it's not directly related to your talk, but if you have anything to say about it, I'd be curious, the, the, the fact that you mentioned these Fry curves have extra level structure that can lead to uh, points on these curves. I, I don't know much about that, I'd be curious. Yeah, uh, because they have two torsion, three torsion. Uh, most of the time, the Frey curve attached to the uh, Fermat equation. I, I don't have the equation of the curve uh, in my slide, uh, and I cannot write down. Sorry, but um, they, they usually have this um, this property. Like um, I think you may remember the one uh, that is attached to the classical Fermat equation, but the others as well. Uh, most of the time, um, they come uh, with this uh, two torsion or three torsion. That's why they have the isogeny. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I have, I have a question. It's sort of complementary to what you're talking about. Um, you, may, you may have already mentioned it at the beginning. Maybe I just missed it. So there are finitely many values of n for which x naught of n has infinitely many quadratic points, right? These are the ones that are either like hyperelliptic or bi-elliptic to a elliptic curve with positive more del Vey rank. So in that case, is is the parameterization of all of the infinitely many quadratic points now known? Uh, for hyperelliptic, yes. But not are there are, are there what about the case where it's bi-elliptic? Uh, there are. Uh, I th I think the complete list is not given. There are some cases that has been done. But I'm not sure the complete uh, if the complete list, list is known. Maybe I can um, let me. I can I come back? Yeah, at the beginning. Um, yeah, you mentioned something that was part of that. Uh, yeah. So uh, for yeah, this was. Um, right. So I guess I'm. Yeah. What about so? The, there are cases where it is bi elliptic to an elliptic curve that has positive mordel v rank? Exactly, yes, yes. Is that just, is that, is that just much harder or no one, no one has gotten to that yet or, or what? I, I think it depends, like, I mean, if you look at the level N71 already, I mean, at, at, you will need the model, a good model. <laughs> Everything comes to that at some point. So, I mean, um, as, when you want, um, the, the cases that you mentioned, uh, their levels are much higher. And the first obstacle that comes to my mind is finding a good model and find, writing down the JMAP exclusively. That would be the first step. Uh, well, I mean, as I'm saying it myself, pulling back all points on an elliptic curve of positive rank sounds a lot harder than pulling back yeah, all points on the projected true, line. Yeah. So uh, pro yeah. <laughs> probably it is harder, but, but yeah, yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, no, there are definitely lots of open things here. That's, that's what's nice about it. <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, so actually, so um, there are some cases where the, bi the uh, uh, degree two map to a positive rank elliptic curve have been done. So that was done by Yosha Box. So if you look at some of his that's values, yes, so I think X naught 65, I think that's one example. So you do have infinitely many, and he sort of has a way of uh, mm -hmm. classifying all, all of them. So he finds all of the finitely many exceptional ones. Uh, so this, some cases have been done by Box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You're right. I hope this is a quick question. Um, I wanted to ask, I, based on the way you do the computations, it seems like you're trying to do sort of a lot of more Delvey sieving at the expense of explicitly computing Riemann rock spaces. Mm -hmm. Are there still some Riemann rock spaces at the end that you have to compute? Yes, <laughs> yes. And yes. Are, those, are those just easier than doing I guess I'm trying to ask about why the initial strategy you presented in your talk is not what you pursued. Oh, because, I mean, I, I would just say, uh, be, be, before trying it, I would just assume it was work, it, it would work. I tried it for several months and it didn't work. The computations were never ending. Like, I, I, it's like, I was asking, you know, find the Riemann rock space, here's my divisor. Yeah, go for it. No, it wasn't I mean, days and days working and it wasn't coming with an answer. I, I guess it's just hard. <laughs> I see. Yeah. And the, for the Riemann rocks computations you were able to do, was it because the degree of the divisor was lower, which meant that it was easier no, the, to do? Or? The, 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 um, the number of divisors that we had to do this computation was much significantly much less. So you can do this for one divisor, for two, but you cannot, it's, it's hard to do this for, you know, uh, maybe 20 of them. So we were, we, we had to eliminate uh, the candidates uh, for, to compute the Riemann space. And uh, at the end of the day, sometimes we will not eliminate all of them. Oh, here's, here's four. We don't know if all these four are in there, but at least uh, they cannot be more than these four. So that, that gave us you know, uh, a, a guess for the Jacobi, either the one that contains all these four or maybe just the two of them. Like, uh, but if you have 20, then uh, it's never ending and you don't know even if the, all those 20 are there already. So, yeah. But I, I didn't know it was too long uh, before I tried to do it. <laughs> You're right, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so Ekin, I'm curious, um, how long did these computations take in say the genus five cases? Um, like not that long, yeah. I, after all these um, simplifications, I'm at first like uh, it was much much longer. But then um, we found this, uh, you know, uh, sieving better or a little bit like more uh, in that group theory problem. We made little improvements. So at the end of the day, if I remember correctly, the the longest one took less than uh, five hours or so. So compared to days, this is much better. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so you think like uh, extending that beyond genus five, d d uh, d do you think that will then start taking days or? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we kind of, at some point we got tired and stopped. <laughs> That's my honest answer, so. Right, yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah, we, it, it might be worth to try it afterwards too, yeah. It's may, maybe worth commenting. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but so Martin Derrick certainly is that there are often tricks one can do to speed up some of these Riemann rock computations if you're willing to dig in and get your hands dirty and not just depend on what's already built into magma. Um, I, will, I would love that because I haven't, I mean, I'm not an expert in that at all, like in the computational part. I just ask magma if it can do it, I'm happy. If it cannot, then I'm sad and try to do something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we've all been there. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's good to check that, yeah, thanks. 